Mexico. As soon as you cross its border or get off a plane, you immediately sense that you're in another country. The principal language is Spanish, but there is something else about the people that's special. Probably one of the first things you notice about Mexicans is their acute sense of history and their pride in it. They encourage you to visit the ruins of its ancient cities and you are told about the civilization that created them. Everywhere you look, there are reminders of Mexico's history. The architecture clearly demonstrates the influence of colonial Spain and the Catholic Church on Mexico's culture. There are other legacies from the past, too, some of them puzzling to foreigners. How can a farmer survive with such primitive techniques? <laughs> Mexico City is the embodiment of contrasts. On the one hand, it's an international commercial center. For most people, though, life is hard. The city is a magnet, attracting job seekers from the countryside. The majority of them, however, don't find work. In what's becoming the world's most populous city, we see peddlers who sit on the sidewalk selling their wares to passers-by, much as their ancestors have done for centuries. In the United States, there seems to be a compulsion to modernize, to throw out the old ways. Of course, that pressure exists in Mexico as well. But Mexico has always been able to accommodate outside influences in a manner that permits its people to maintain their unique identity as Mexicans. The thread that runs through all of Mexico's history is the ability of its people to blend the old ways with the new, maintaining a deep respect for tradition. That tradition is rooted in the indigenous population of Mexico. And to understand some of its power, the people of the southern states of Oaxaca and Chiapas provide some clues. One of the oldest cities in Mexico is San Cristobal de las Casas in the state of Chiapas. The conquistadores, or the conquerors of America, established the town as Villa Real on a Maya settlement in 1528. As you travel through southern Mexico today, you will probably be struck with two impressions of the Indians. One is the strength of their traditional culture. The other is that they seem terribly poor. But we should be careful about feeling sorry for the Indians, especially in terms of thinking that modern, westernized society is superior and has all the answers to the problems of poverty. Not One person who sees a danger in what modern society is doing to the Indians is Gertrude Duby Blum a Swiss journalist and Indian rights activist who came to Mexico in 1940. Known to her friends as Trudy, she is now in her mid-80s and is still active in fighting for Indian rights. We come like a tank tractor into their pueblos, into the land. She and her husband, Franz Blom, established a residence in San Cristobal called Nabolom, the house of the jaguar. It's operated today as a guest house for tourists, journalists, and scholars who want to learn about the Indians of Chiapas. People come to Nabolom from all over the world to study the Mayan culture and to meet Trudy. Her original purpose in coming to Mexico was to lead escapees out of fascist-dominated Europe. But even before she got to Mexico, she was fascinated by its Indians. Well, I read about them. In, uh, when I came over to the United States in uh, 1940, <coughs> I had a book by Jacques Soustel, the uh, French anthropologist, about Mexico, mostly Chiapas, and the Lacandones. And I decided to go, and I would go to Mexico from, I was six months. In 1943, she met and married Franz Blom, an archaeologist and map maker. Together, they went on numerous expeditions, documenting the life and history of many Mayan Indian groups in southern Mexico, 
especially the Lacandon Indians. What was special about the Lacandon Mayas was that unlike most Indians in Mexico, they lived in lowland jungles that were too severe for the conquistadores to explore. The Lacandones were not influenced by outsiders until this century. France died in 1963, but Trudy remained in Mexico. Her humanitarian work with the Lacandon Indians has gained her the respect of all Mexicans. Trudy's photographs are documents of the centuries-old Lacandon culture and its threatened destruction during the last 40 years by slash-and-burn farming, deforestation, and other intrusions from the outside. Sadly, she admits that some of the old ways are being lost. You know, you cannot force any person to keep tradition they don't want to keep. We cannot force an Indian to tell him, you should keep your beautiful costume when he wants to put our ugly clothes on. That's his right to do. We, have, we cannot intervene in that space. If he wants to use only a car and not walk anymore, which he did and was healthy, well, go around the corner to buy some cigarettes in a car. What can we do again? We brought it in. Trudy wants the outside world to know about Indian traditions, perhaps in the hope that those who seek to bring about change will be sensitive to Indian needs. One way you can begin to appreciate the importance of tradition to Indian life today is to attend a festival in an Indian town. In Tenalo, about two hours from San Cristobal, the Festival of St. Peter is held at the end of June each year. The activities begin early. Indians from Chenalo and the neighboring village of Mitontic gather at dawn. These are Mayan Indians, but unlike the Lacandon Mayas, who were isolated in the lowland forests of Chiapas during colonial days, Ancestors of these highland people were heavily influenced by Spain and the Catholic Church. Each Indian town took a Catholic saint as its patron. The patron saint of the Chenalo is St. Peter. The special feature of this festival is that residents of the village of Mitontic carry their town's patron, St. Michael, to visit St. Peter on his day. During that visit, St. Peter and St. Michael symbolically greet each other and thereby rekindle the friendship of the two villages. Bueno, estas fiestas son tradicionales. Jacinto Arias is a Mexican government official who heads an agriculture development agency in San Cristobal. A graduate of Princeton University, he himself is from Chenalo. Desde el tiempo de la colonia, aunque no son fiestas precolombinas, sino que son fiestas que se fueron este, haciendo después de la colonia o durante el tiempo de la colonia. En estas fiestas se celebra principalmente algunos santos. Cada municipio tiene su patrón. La fiesta del Santo Patrono es la fiesta más importante de cada uno de los municipios. Ustedes presenciaron en Chinaló la fiesta del Santo Patrono de San Pedro Chinaló. ¿Qué es lo que significa la fiesta? Más que símbolos, ¿no es sentido? ¿Qué significa la fiesta? Como les decía al principio, el Santo Patrono es el santo que vela sobre el pueblo. Es el que nos representa, representa al pueblo ante el Dios máximo. Los que cargan la fiesta, que son los alférez, los capitanes, los mayordomos, son los que cargan las festividades religiosas. Entonces, en ese sentido, son los representantes del pueblo. Si la persona, por ejemplo, al tomar la responsabilidad, no cumple con sus obligaciones, no es nada más responsabilidad suya y las consecuencias no nada más le vienen a él, 
sino que también son consecuencias que pueden venir sobre el pueblo. ¿Cuáles podrían ser? Podrían ser hambre, enfermedad, diversos tipos de, de, de males, como sería la invasión externa, etc. Todo esto es lo que hay que evitar y para eso son las fiestas del patrón. As strong as these traditions are, economic pressures and other circumstances over which Indians have little control have nevertheless eroded many of their values and traditions. Natural dyes had, had died out um, about uh, 30, 40 years ago. People have forgotten completely how to do that. Chip Morris is an American who came to Chiapas over a decade ago to study weaving. With a woman from here in town and experimenting with plants and experimenting with, with everything possible and eventually developed a whole range of colors that could be used, which is very fortunate because in Mexico you cannot buy commercial wool yarns. Mexican factories only produce acrylic yarns. In 1975, he helped establish a government-supported cooperative where weavers could recover their traditional techniques. The co-op focuses on the most traditional goods. The co-op... Um, uh, found that the, the things that were most interesting to weave and the things that would sell the best were the oldest styles, the most intricate weaves, the, the most delicate patterns. Uh, these patterns are very old. Um, although the oldest cloth in Chiapas is only about 100 years old, the designs themselves can be traced back for over a thousand years. Today, some 3,000 weavers make and sell their products through the co-op store. Um, it now functions by itself, which is very nice. It's a successful project. Among the oldest reflections of Mexico's past is the ceremonial city of Monte Alban. Its ruins are located in the state of Oaxaca, just west of the state of Chiapas. There had been human settlements in the area as early as 4,000 B.C. Building began here about 800 B.C., 900 years before construction was started on the more well-known pyramids of the sun and moon near Mexico City. The major builders of Monte Alban were the Zapotec Indians, who still live in the area. They look upon Monte Alban with pride, knowing that the city forms a special part of their history. Miguel Angel Schultz, an architect and historian, traces his own background through his Zapotec Indian ancestors rather than through his German grandfather. Monte Alban se encuentra situado al sur este, suroeste de la ciudad de Oaxaca. Su carretera sinuosa tiene 11 kilómetros de distancia. Se, donde nos encontramos, estamos en, sobre la plataforma norte. Tiene, Monte Albán se ha considerado tres culturas importantes. La primera, la cultura Olmecoide. Después viene Monte Albán I, Monte Albán II y Monte Albán III, que viene su iniciación zapoteca, luego viene el clásico y su decadencia. Más tarde, ya en su decadencia, cuando Monte Albán es, digamos, es dejado, los mixtecos toman posición de Monte Albán pero ya en la época de Cosijoesa y Guasilindanta. Monte Albán was a ceremonial city, central to the Indians' governance and religion, as were the other ancient cities built before the Spaniards arrived. Most of them were abandoned by the time Cortés marched into Mexico. Monte Albán, in fact, was missed by the Spaniards, and the ruins were undiscovered by archaeologists until the 19th century. One of the most impressive ceremonial cities in Mexico was still in use at the time of the conquest, Mitla. It's only about 30 miles from Monte Alban, but it was developed much later, about 900 AD, by both Zapotec and Mixtec Indians. The name Mitla comes from the Nahuatl, and it means place of the dead. Zapotec noblemen and war heroes were buried in chambers underneath the city. It's considered one of the architectural wonders of ancient Mexico, not for its size, but because of its beauty, 
and the mystery of its construction. Whoever the creators of Mitla were, they were extraordinarily resourceful. The workers had no pack animals, no wheel, yet they still managed to pull mammoth stones from distant quarries for Mitla's construction. The entrances and the columns that held up the roofs weighed tons. Their presence in this place is a tribute to incredible engineering ingenuity. The intricately placed mosaic stones that decorate its walls provide strength, and the walls have withstood earthquakes and storms for centuries. Some of Mitla's buildings were destroyed, however, by the Spaniards who dismantled them. The missionaries used the material to build a new structure. The sanctity of the stones of Mitla was transferred to the church that stands today alongside this extraordinary city. The use of parts from Indian shrines to build churches was a common practice during the colonial period. In a town near Mitla called Teotitlan del Valle, the church was partly constructed with stones from one of those shrines. Hints of this intermingling of Catholic and Indian religions can still be seen in Teotitlan. Each year, the festival of the precious blood of Christ is celebrated with a procession of the saints carried in baskets. Religious festivals that honor Catholic saints were instituted by Spanish priests. The job was probably made easier because the saints were very similar to the Indians' gods. In fact, there were many other similarities between Catholicism and the local religion. They were both based on man's subservience to the supernatural. Both had important figures who sacrificed themselves because of their willingness to serve God. In Teotitlan, the festival is more Spanish than Indian. Although the Danza de la Pluma the feather dance that forms a part of the festival is Zapotec. The theme is really based on the conquest of the Aztec Emperor Montezuma by Cortez. The dancers are accompanied by a brass band and children dressed as Spanish soldiers. Nevertheless, the festival that was begun centuries ago is still celebrated every year on the first Wednesday in July. Not far from Mitla, on the road to Oaxaca City is the shop of Senor Valente Nieto in the village of San Bartolo Coyotepec. His business is the manufacture and sale of the world famous Oaxaca black pottery. He learned the skill of ceramic making from his mother, Doña Rosa, whose potting technique was so renowned that her work was sought by North Americans as well as Mexicans. He uses a primitive potting wheel, a method that has been passed on from generation to generation for over 2,000 years. Esta forma de trabajar lo he aprendido de mi de mis papás. Mi, mi papá hacía muchas grandes las piezas. Mi mamá, mi mamá se llamó Rosa Real Mateo. Ella fue muy famosa y la conocieron. Muchas partes del mundo la conocieron como Doña Rosa. Ella trabajó este, unos 70 años haciendo las vasijas, cántaros, diferentes figuras. Y de ahí aprendimos nosotros y seguimos la tradición. En el proceso de trabajo nosotros hacemos, por ejemplo, hasta... 40, 50 piezas formadas en un día. Ahí está la forma del cántaro. Es una forma que es muy tradicional y se conoce como cántaro de Coyotepec. Se sigue trabajando con el cuero y puede hacerse en otra forma. ¿eh? Ahí tienen otra forma, que es un jarro. Through Doña Rosa and her careful nurturing of the traditional skills passed down to her and then passed on to her son, people today have a personal contact with the beauty of Mexico's past. 
The preservation of traditional practices for their own sake in the modern world is not easy. They somehow have to work if they are to survive. In Chiapas, a cooperative was the way to fit traditional weaving into the 20th century economic system in Mexico. In Teotitlan del Valle, where manufacture of rugs and tapestries is the primary occupation, mechanical looms were introduced so that the weaving would be more efficient. Many old techniques, however, are still in use. The businesses are family run, handed down from generation to generation. Yo me acuerdo desde que tenía yo, digamos, este, siete años, empecé yo a este, aprender a cardar la lana. Después empecé a aprender a hilar. Y así fue cuando, y así fue como empecé yo este, a, a trabajar, pues, en la artesanía. Y ya cuando cumplí yo mis 12 años, fue cuando empe me empezaron a enseñar a hacer así este, tapetes sencillos. Es como yo empecé. To hand down from parent to child values and traditions is something that goes on all over the world. In Mexico, as in Illinois or New England, the experience gained over generations is passed on. In the United States, though, traditions are sometimes thrown out and replaced by a trendy idea just because it's new. Of course, Mexicans are not immune to outside influences or new ways to get things done. Nevertheless, many of the old ways endure, especially when it comes to getting through the day. For example, in the Indian villages, the cure for common ills or the method for calming a colicky baby may seem quaint and perhaps superstitious. But to this Zapotec mother, it makes perfect sense. A casual observer can clearly see that the child seems relaxed and content. Its mother's belief that her use of an herb and a turkey egg is responsible for making her baby better is perhaps no more irrational than modern parents' belief that exposing their infants to Beethoven or Bach or to show them numbered flashcards will make them prodigies in music or mathematics. The tradition that almost everyone agrees works very well is the marketplace. The market has been a center for trade and social gatherings since pre-conquest Mexico, when the organizational and political strength of a town was measured by its market. There are two basic types of markets. The first type is the daily market, like this one in Oaxaca City. Merchants are on duty every day to serve shoppers. There are also periodic markets held once a week, which are found in the smaller towns. Merchants travel from one town to the next. Each day of the week, they set up in a different place. The market area is owned by the municipalities, and each merchant is taxed, actually pays rent, for his space. These rents form a substantial part of municipal revenue. Mexican markets still exist as they have for centuries, because they are practical. There is also the sentiment that other traditions must be preserved because they are beautiful, and they make a spiritual link to the past. Dance is the one that has caught the popular imagination. In the state of Oaxaca alone, there are over a hundred folk dance groups. One of the newest is a group called Simatl, an Indian word that means roots. Its director and choreographer is Fidel Silva. Este, yo soy el encargado hasta el momento del taller de danza mexicana. Estudié en la Ciudad de México en el Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes, en la Escuela Nacional de Danza Folclórica. Depende de la Secretaría de Educación Pública y del Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes de, de México. En esta escuela a nosotros nos dan elementos y técnica para desglosar eh, los diferentes pasos que predominan en la danza mexicana. The 
group not only performs dances, but under its director, members conduct research to learn how the dances are actually performed by the people in small towns and villages.